Good afternoon. Uh, I'm a child of the communication era, and uh, that's a good thing because I like communicating. <clears throat> Uh, the next generation, they can have their artificial intelligence and their robots and their George Jetson-inspired self-driving cars, but I think the age in which um, I'm growing up in and getting old in is going to be defined as the age in which communication was proliferating at such a great extent that pretty much anyone on the planet could communicate with anyone else on the planet whenever they like. In fact, I would argue, this is the golden age of communication. But of course, it wasn't always like this. Communication was slightly different when I was growing up as a kid. In America, as a child, in school, we used to get these mimeographed handouts from our teachers, and they reeked of that purple ink that, was, uh, that they were made of. And when the teachers ran out of those handouts, communication in the 70s, they had to run back to the school office roll that big drum there, and then create some new handouts to pass to us. By the time I was 13, 14, I was waking up at 4.45 in the morning to train for my cross-country team here, and I also happened to deliver the local newspaper, just so happened to be the Washington Post, which was a big deal back then. But for most Americans, the average American, getting your morning newspaper was a major source of your content, your information, and your news. And my customers, they demanded that they get that newspaper by 6.30 in the morning. So I had to do a lot of running. At the time, CNN was barely new, maybe a few years old. And the idea of 24-hour news was a novel idea. In fact, some people actually still found it odd. I mean, why would you want to have the news on all the time? Why would you need to have access to the news 24 hours a day? Which is crazy if you think about it in today's terms. By the time I went to college in America in 1986, I was fortunate enough to go to an institution that was a little bit ahead of its time. We had an internal email system that was campus-wide, we had networked printers, and 98% of us had one of these bad boys. <laughs> Knowledge was already widely dispersed, information was starting to fragment, communication was starting to be more uh, rapidly disseminated and received. So if you'd asked me 25 years ago, could I predict where we'd be today with communication? <clears throat> I'm not sure I would have got everything right, but certainly there are some trends there. Communication, like so many other things, was inextricably being pulled in the direction of efficiency. Back to the future in 2015, and I'm able to share anything I want with anyone I want be it a photograph that caught my eye in London just a couple weeks ago, or an album that I listened to the other day, I can share that with the entire world immediately. And it's not just about self-expression, it's about the connections that I have in that social world, and the content and the richness that they share. My awareness grows, my knowledge grows, in fact, even, I would argue, my values grow. Communication is occurring faster, it is smaller, it's more widely distributed, it's more transient. I would argue that communication has become micronized. Now, what is micronization? In the physical world, micronization refers to taking solid substances and smashing them or making them much smaller, down to the point of microns, in fact. Similar micronization processes are occurring in the business world as we speak, and they've been accelerating for the last 10 years, ever since Web 2.0 really, really took off. Micronization processes are leveling many things. They're pulverizing big structural processes in the corporate environment. What are the market forces that are, that are sort of driving micronization? I would argue that actually language itself is being altered. Gone are the days when we actually write letters or even send one of these to each other anymore. This is a Christmas card, by the way. <laughs> language itself is being altered. Do we send emails as much as we used to? The answer is no. Why? Emails are not as efficient as they once were. We're finding new ways to communicate. Language and the very writing and dictionaries that we use 
are being altered and changed dramatically. We abbreviate words like crazy. This is one of my personal faves. <laughs> we are creating countless acronyms, particularly when things are like too long to read, right? We're creating new words themselves, and I would argue potentially even new languages. This is an example of LEET, if you're not familiar with this. This is sort of a, LEET is, is sort of a, a, langu a quasi language that's developed by engineers, popularized by gamers, and it basically is a way to sort of reference words in ASCII defined characters. So this is newbie, or somebody who's not accustomed to something. Increasingly, we use punctuation, not even actual words to describe something, or graphical representations like emoticons to signify how we feel. These new, shorter, and abbreviated ways of communicating are transforming the way we communicate and speak to one another. And unless you think this is a trend or a fad that's going to go away, may I remind you that LOL actually entered the Oxford English Dictionary four years ago in 2011. And it's still here. We still use it. A little bit outdated, but you know, we still use it. Now, this evolving language is actually driving the way we chat and the way we message each other. Technical consultancy Deloitte predicted last year that instant messaging in the UK would overtake SMS messaging by a long way. My point is that we're still doing both in great amounts. It looks like a hockey stick when you look at this in the UK. 300 billion instant messages sent last year, 140 billion SMS messages. Facebook, on a global basis, claimed to have 500 million users of Messenger, its app for chat. WhatsApp claimed to have 700 million users globally. And although Apple don't break out their numbers, Apple, you can be assured, they have hundreds of millions of people using iMessages. And now, we're looking at a world where chat is actually being grouped together, again, for efficiency. Group chat is surging in popularity at the minute. Now when I speak to my girls, I speak to them both at the same time, and they speak to me at the same time. It's like a conference call on instant messaging, where we're all dialed in. This is how everyone is communicating in chat this, this day. This is surging so much so that Facebook announced a standalone group app in November, and Apple launched uh, group functionality in their iMessages back in September. Everyone's a photographer these days. There are 350 million photographs put onto Facebook each and every day. And they're not all just pretty sunsets on Instagram. We now use our cameras for note-taking, for reminders, for comparison shopping, for self-improvement, even, in some cases, not mine, applying makeup. Video is more popular than ever before. YouTube remains one of the most highly trafficked sites in the world. Facebook, since June, has said that there have been more than an average of one billion videos viewed daily on Facebook. Ofcom in the UK announced this last year in their communications and, and uh, market report. The total volume of media and communications activity undertaken by UK adults each day equates to more than 11 hours, but as some activities are conducted simultaneously, this is squeezed into eight hours, 41 minutes a day, meaning we're multitasking better than we ever have before, and we're getting more efficient as we do it. What does this mean for the enterprise? How does the enterprise embrace micronization? And in fact, does it have any choice in the matter? Internal communications, if you're working in a corporate environment or an enterprise, are being radically restructured, just like language itself. Top-heavy communications are being altered and augmented and supplemented by communications from the ground up. Ground floor chatter is widely distributed throughout an organization. And if your internal communications platform does not cater for that, does not allow for that, and does not embrace for that, I would argue that, that ground floor chatter migrates to another platform. Snapchat, Twitter, Reddit, Facebook. It leaves the organization. Big heavy tomes, manuals, documents 
are written these days. If they are, they're never read. And as soon as they're published, they're almost always out of date. Ideas, decisions, proposals, they can be disseminated at lightning speed, and they can be responded to in terms of responses, modifications, very, very quickly as well. The organization is incredibly wide and flat. Well, what does this mean to the enterprise today? May I introduce you to Tyrell Oates. If you've not heard of him, 30 years old, from Portland, Oregon. He worked for a well-known U.S. bank, and in October last year, he decided to ask his big bank CEO boss for a pay rise. And so he drafted this note, and when he did it, he decided to copy in 200,000 of his colleagues. <laughs> so he couldn't copy in everyone in the company, he only had the addresses for 200,000. But when he asked his boss for a pay rise, he also suggested that they all get pay rises. Whether or not you think this is right, whether or not you think this is wrong, is kind of immaterial. The point is, the organization is flat. Everyone in the enterprise knows everything immediately. Good news and bad news, doesn't matter. The organization is increasingly flat. And those who are in leadership in an organization or an enterprise need to recognize that. Group chat is now a norm. We talked about it from a personal basis, and now when you look at it in the enterprise, this is one of the most organic and easy ways to get projects delivered. This here is a Skype chat from our own company, and you can see here we've got no physical barriers, we've got no geographical barriers, we've got no hierarchical barriers. We happen to have a director, we have some people who are very young in the business here, some of whom started off maybe as apprentices, communicating with people as if they're best friends and colleagues, working hard to get something done. This is po pointing to one thing, increased and better engagement in the workforce. More rapid and fragmented communications equals more engagement. More engagement equals more commitment. As people understand what they're supposed to be doing, we're all aligned better, we get the information quicker. More engagement equals a happier workforce, because people know and they derive good meaning from what they're doing. And a happier workforce will bring more success. Now, in <coughs> the future, you m maybe have heard of ambient, ambient notifications, ambient communications, ambient alerts. You'll start to see, in the coming years, ambient sort of communications will start to encroach onto the enterprise, making us more productive and making us yet more efficient. Here's an example of a colleague of mine who was in the Louvre in Paris two weeks ago. She has a Nintendo DS with her. The Nintendo DS knows she's in the Louvre. It pinpoints precisely where she is. Not only that, when she walks by a piece of artwork, it recommends that she listens to a talk about that piece of art. That is pretty clever. That is ambient, and that is happening today. The future of the enterprise, it's really simple. In my opinion, we're becoming more cerebral. We're becoming living, thinking, breathing organisms in our collective organizations, wherever we work. The structures are flattened. We're more highly connected. We have short, sharp communications whizzing back and forth. Things are much more transient, and we're thinking in an amplified way. And this is going to be a term that you're going to hear lots of in the next few years, the amplified intelligence of the enterprise. If you're embracing micronization in terms of communication, you're going to see improvements in not just communications, but engagement, speed with which you can respond to things, problem solving, and knowledge in terms of market understanding and competitive awareness. It's a pretty exciting time if you're interested in it. Let me turn the clock back, though, 750 years. This week saw the 750th anniversary of Parliament at Westminster. And we owe it to this guy, Simon de Montfort, a Frenchman, I should point out, who pretty much staged a revolt in England in 1264 when he beat King Henry III at the Battle of Lewis, and he took him hostage, basically kidnapped him. But SDM, as I like to call this guy in his abbreviated and micronized version, Recognized that his power was waning in December of 1264, he sent out invites all across the land, knights, clergymen, barons, 
and Burgesses were invited to convene on January 20th, 1265, 750 years ago, for what they called then the Commons. And it was the predecessor of what is now today the House of Commons. And I would argue that not only did SDM usher in unwittingly representative politics in this country and arguably globally, but he also perhaps ushered in a wave of something that I call micronization. Shifting power from one to many nascent parliamentarians. And those forces that he ushered in for us are being ushered in to the enterprise, allowing us to work at the speed of change and even thought itself. Thank you very much.